Hey everybody, welcome back to Classical Christian Thought. I'm your host, Eric Ibarra. So, <clears throat> some of you guys who watch uh, the regular media on, in the fellowship of online Catholic social media will remember that a couple days ago, if it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, I showed up on Rules for Retrogrades. Uh, which is a YouTube channel that belongs to Timothy Gordon. And the subject of discussion was Pope Francis and um, the study that we were conducting there was mostly on uh, the uh, document, the decree of Pope Francis Amoris Laetitia. And <clears throat> so if you want to go listen to three hours of, uh, you know, back and forth on, the issue of Amoris Laetitia, go ahead and listen to that. Uh, but I, you know, I, I've never actually done a stream where I've taken people through how I understand Amoris Laetitia and how um, it has been confirmed to be interpreted by Pope Francis himself, by um, the closest advisors of his that. Uh, are you know have have verified what the interpretation is uh on, specifically on chapter eight regarding remarried divorcees uh, pretty much everything else in the document is uh ignored um by uh, you know mainstream media um which is you know for ill or for better it it it, it doesn't really matter um the the subject of concern is uh, the new rule, the new door that's been opened with uh, remarried divorcees. And uh, there's been some interpretations online that have been offered in defense of Pope Francis, or uh, I should say in an attempt to defend Pope Francis from unwanted interpretations of Amoris Laetitia. And uh, those interpretations, um, you, you hear them uh, from, you know, people who are uh, concerned about, uh, you know, giving Pope Francis a very charitable interpretation. And um, usually that interpretation says that nothing has changed uh, and that really um, <clears throat> uh, somebody who is uh, uh, divorced while they're uh, spouse is still living while they are still obligated by the uh, indissoluble bond of marriage. Um, they cannot, uh, if, if a person is divorced and, and their first spouse is still alive, which retains that bond of union, uh, uh, if they are civilly remarried and they want to uh, come to the church, after that civil remarriage, where they live in Moro Uxurio. You'll hear me say that from time to time. What that means is in uh, it's living in, in sexual intercourse outside of the marital, bo marital bond. So that basically adult an adulterous intercourse, Moro more Uxurio. Um, so somebody who is divorced from their lawful spouse, uh, while they're still alive, and then they've contracted a new union civilly, and then they come to church and want to receive Holy Communion. Some people have put the interpretation out there that Pope Francis and Amoris Laetitia simply say that they have to live in perfect continence. And if they fail, they just go to communion, repent, say that they messed up and that they're going to get their act together and never do it again and pursue the highway of holiness. And then and only then can they receive holy communion. So this is the interpretation taken by some online uh, uh, apologists for uh, Pope Francis, the Vatican, and, and what have you. Uh, I'm going to say that that interpretation is demonstrably false, okay? And um, there's also another stream that I've done with Dr. Pedro Gabriel and Jonathan Prejan. That's on my sh my YouTube channel. You can look it up. 
Um, I also didn't participate that much in that stream because my role in that presentation was to facilitate a discussion between Pedro and Jonathan. Uh, the discussion on rules for retrogrades, um, I was also kind of um, quiet for most of the time because Classical Theist and Timothy Gordon were going back and forth. So I figured, you know, maybe it would be good to do a stream where I'm giving you what I understand to be the interpretation. And, um, and, and so this is what we're doing here. So the first thing we want to do is uh, say that for anybody who's completely unaware of this debate, those of you who are brand new to uh, the documents, they've never read a Morris, um, this stream is probably not for you. Um, I'm going to assume that my listeners and my viewers are relatively familiar with the document, what it intended, at least what it speaks to, the, the general, you know, chapter eight speaks to the issue of remarried divorcees and Holy Communion, and also some of the clarificatory documents that came out afterwards, in particular, the guidelines of the Buenos Aires bishops region. Uh, you need to be familiar with that document because, as I will show, Pope Francis uh, personally uh, appropriated those guidelines and said there is no other interpretation of Amoris Laetitia, which means that he put his stamp of approval on what those guidelines say. Secondly, he put those guidelines in the Apostolic Chesedes, Acta uh, Apostolic Chesedes, which is the Acts of the Apostolic See. <clears throat> Think of like the uh, a file cabinet with all the authoritative decrees of the Holy See. Um, that's what uh, Pope Francis put it in. And um, Cardinal Fernandez, Tucho Fernandez, when he was archbishop, uh, said that that elevated the uh, Buenos Aires guidelines to the level of the authentic magisterium. So where do we go to find the true interpretation of Amoris Laetitia? Those guidelines. So that's what I'm going to share with you on my screen. Just give me a second here. Uh, I'm not the fastest with this stuff. Okay. All right. So uh, hopefully you can see the screen. Uh, this is um, going to be the uh, article that was put out by, by Fox. It's called, uh, it was on September 19th, 2016, Guidelines of Buenos Aires Bishops on Divorced and Remarried. And um, you'll see that this is uh, a, it's a reliable English interpretation. All right, so we're just going to start off reading uh, from that so we can get uh, confirmed with what I just said. All right, dear priests, we have received with joy the exhortation Amoris Laetitia, which invites us above all to encourage the growth of love between spouses and to motivate the youth to opt for marriage in a family. These are important issues that should never be disregarded or overshadowed by other matters. Francis has opened several doors in pastoral care for families, and we are invited to leverage this time of mercy with a view to endorsing as a pilgrim church the richness offered by the different chapters of this apostolic exhortation. We will now focus on chapter 8, since it refers to the guidelines of the bishops in order to discern on the potential access to sacraments of the divorced who have entered a new union. We deem it convenient as bishops of the same pastoral region to agree on some basic criteria. We present them without prejudice to the authority of each bishop that each bishop has over his own diocese to clarify, complete, or restrict them. All right, so we're going to go through the guidelines beginning with the first one. So guideline number one. Firstly, we should remember that it is not advisable to speak of permissions 
to have access to sacraments, but of a discernment process in the company of a pastor. It is a personal and pastoral discernment. Um, so, you know, what that means is that this is not about uh, giving somebody uh, sort of like an indefinite permit that they could just come and receive communion as if the green light is on and as long as it's on, you can come in and receive communion. Rather, it's 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 more complex than that. It, it, it's, it's a matter of, well, hold on, let's talk about this. Let's see if we can discern whether the light is green or not. It's not just some open permit. All right, guideline number two. In this path, the pastor should emphasize the fundamental proclamation, the kerygma, so as to foster or renew a personal encounter with the living Christ. So what that is, uh, is talking about is just an emphasis on the, the proclamation of the gospel, the, 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 um, the good news of Jesus Christ that fulfills the Old Testament and inaugurated the New Testament with the apostolic church. Okay, guideline number three. Pastoral accompaniment is an exercise of the via caritas, or the way of love. It is an invitation to follow the way of Jesus, the way of mercy, and reinstatement. This itinerary requires the pastoral charity of the priest who receives the penitent, listens to him or her attentively, and shows him or her the maternal face of the church, while also accepting his or her righteous intention and good purpose to devote his or her life to the light of the gospel and to the and to practice charity. All right, so that's nothing complicated. Everything seems to be pretty fine so far. All right, guideline number four. This path, again, remember, when it says this path, it's referring back to a certain antecedent, um, which is this. We will now focus on chapter 8, since it refers to the guidelines of the bishops in order to discern on the potential access or the potential path to sacraments of the divorce and remarried. So when number 4 begins with this path, that is uh, what we're talking about. All right, so this path, this via caritas, does not necessarily finish in the sacraments. It may also lead to other ways of achieving further integration into the life of the church, greater presence in the community, participation in prayer or reflection groups, engagement in ecclesial services. So this is just, this number, this fourth guideline is just saying that um, it's not as if it's a failure if we can't bring a remarried divorcee back to the sacraments. It's not a failure. Uh, part of this via caritas, this way of mercy, may be leading them to something short of the sacraments, like, uh, you know, appearing in the community more, participating in prayer or small groups, men's groups, women groups, and in, in engagement in, in ecclesial services, perhaps to the poor, um, in organizing retreats or, you know, things like this. It's short of the sacraments, but they're still integrated into the community in some way. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to get into the fifth and the sixth guideline, which is really where we're going to, you know, uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh guideline is really the heart of these guidelines and really what we're going to focus on because it answers the question as to whether, um, whether uh, Bishop, I mean, I'm sorry, whether Pope Francis um, did open the door for uh, remarried divorcees without an annulment to remain, continue, and even plan for more uxurio and also be absolved in the confessional and receive communion even without the strict resolve to completely quit from adulterous uh, uh, intercourse, more uxorio, okay? All right, so let's get into 
Guideline number five, whenever feasible, depending on the specific circumstances of a couple, especially when both partners are Christians walking the path of faith, a proposal may be made to resolve to live in continence. Amoris Laetitia does not ignore the difficulties arising from this option and offers the possibility of having access to the sacrament of reconciliation if the partners fail in this purpose. All right. So let's stop there and see what is being said in this fifth guideline. All right. So this goes back to the pontificate of John Paul II. Under his pontificate, it was allowed for remarried divorcees who found it extremely difficult to just pack up their bags and walk away from each other for the rest of their lives. Um, because there were children involved in, the, in, in this new union. How is it that you can just, you know, have a new civil union, you never even knew that you were married, that you couldn't remarry, and you've got three or four kids in this new civil union, they're all under the age of 15, all the way down to two, and uh, what do you do? Does the mother and the father just walk away from each other? Well, this difficulty was um, presented to John Paul II, and John Paul II uh, said that it could we could resolve this where these persons, if they decide to stay together for the sake of the children, um, or if they decide to stay together for some other reason even, that if they live in continence, <clears throat> excuse me, if they live in continence, which means living as brother and sister, meaning separate beds, never in more uxuria, no no romantic activity, no intercourse whatsoever. Living like brother and sister, quite literally. So with that option in mind, um, these people could come to receive communion, right? And, and, and Amoris Laetitia already, according to this fifth guideline, says that it recognizes difficulties with this, and offers the possibility of having access to the sacrament of reconciliation if the partners fail in this purpose. Okay, so <clears throat> this guideline, the fifth guideline, we could say the fifth option would be for remarried divorcees to live as brother and sister in full continence. And when they fail at that, then they can go to uh, the sacrament of reconciliation, be absolved, in which case they would be worth, they would be allowed to receive holy communion. So this is the option that you know presents the the continence route and even accommodates to the failure of continence by giving you a, a recourse to the to the sacrament of confession and then back to communion. If you fail again, obviously you're coming back to the sacrament before you go to receive communion. Uh, in each case a full resolution to perfect continence is the sine qua non, or it's the, it is what is intended by this fifth option or this fifth guideline. Well, we're going to move on to guideline number six now. And this is where we're getting to the crux of the matter. Guideline number six begins by saying, in more complex cases. <clears throat> and when a declaration of nullity has not been obtained, the above-mentioned option may not, in fact, be feasible. We need to stop here, right here. Let's hit pause. In more complex cases, and when a declaration of nullity has not been obtained, the above-mentioned option may not, in fact, be feasible. Well, what option is that? It's number five, what we just told you, what we just read to you which is the way of continence and the way of recovery in, in the event of a failure to come back to communion through confession. Okay. So the option that is not, so number six, guideline number six is telling us 
that that way that that whole proposal of continence when continence fails go to confession be absolved return to communion commit to full and perfect continence if a failure happens again you go back to confession resolve to be live in perfect continence you're absolved you repent come back to communion so that 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 option that that consists of that potential circular cycle right that option may not be feasible all right it's important to understand that it goes on <clears throat> nonetheless a path of discernment is still possible if it is acknowledged that in a concrete case there are limitations that mitigate responsibility and culpability especially when a person believes he or she would incur a subsequent fault by harming the children of the new union amoris laetitia offers the possibility of having access to the sacraments of reconciliation and the eucharist these sacraments in turn prepare the person to continue maturing and growing with the power of grace all right so what is being said here all right so some people in their understanding the only way to defend pope francis from contradicting um veritati splendor or the council of trent what this six guideline is saying is just simply hey you live in continence if you fail you go to confession you uh, you have uh, you 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 confess your sin you commit to continence again you quit you know being in bed with each other and you be you get absolved by the priest and you go back to communion when you fail again if you fail again go to confession don't you don't go to communion you go to confession repent make a firm purpose of amendment to quit uh return to continence and and then you can you know uh present yourself for holy communion now i'll let the audience here take a moment to uh try and figure out why that is not logically coherent between guideline number five and guideline number six let me get a sip of water all right if you're done thinking you should figure it out by now guideline number five was the one that said be committed to perfect continence if you fail go to confession repent from it then you can go to communion and that whole cycle so if number six is telling us the above mention meaning number five may not be feasible that means that everything that exists in this sixth option does not consist necessarily of a couple who is committed to continence okay that's that is the only logical possibility because if we're saying that that's that the fifth option may not be feasible then and then we're going to present another option, which is what it says. An, another path of discernment is still possible, even though they can't choose the route of continence. That means that what we're talking about here is not is not a couple who's being continent. It's a couple who has maintained the plan to proceed with more uxurio. All right. Now, it's not just plain and simple, so don't worry. You know, the, let me say here: um, the guidelines are not just saying, "Hey, the sixth option is if you can't live in continence, just go straight to Holy Communion and don't worry about your sin." 
that's you know there are some folks who um present the interpretation that way uh that's not me um even though um those people who are who are make, giving that interpretation uh it's slightly misrepresenting the case um their worries and their concerns are justified in light of how this will be interpreted and instilled in pastoral practice but nonetheless what's being said here is a little bit more complex than that okay so let's just get that nailed down here that what we're talking about in guideline six are people who cannot make the commitment um one or both in this new civil union they cannot make the commitment to never again um be sexually active okay in fact we're talking about people for whom the, the their plan is to continue being in in moro uxurio all right so what what else does it say all right it says if it is acknowledged that in a concrete case there are limitations that mitigate responsibility and culpability all right let's pause there what does that mean mitigations mitigate a mitigated responsibility um and in concrete cases, uh, culpability. Well, you know, it's hard to describe this in, you know, pure concept. It's easier to describe it in example. And uh, that's what tends to be the case by the defenders of Amoris. So, for example, uh, when he was Archbishop Tucho Fernandez in his, uh, <clears throat> in his famous article that he wrote for the the Medellin, which is a uh, uh, it's a journal for Latin American Bishops Conference. Uh, he wrote an article called Chapter 8 of Amoris Letitia, What is Left After the Storm? And, you know, the author, Victor Manuel Fernandez, um, he chooses and several defenders of Amoris choose the situation of a woman who was married to a Catholic man and um, Perhaps he was abusive um, and abandoned her and left her uh, with children in a very poor city in the middle of Buenos Aires or, you know, in the middle of Bolivia somewhere. In a very poor town, third world country where things are really hard to manage. Well, you know, she's in a situation now where, you know, she's she needs help. Um, she finds uh, a Christian man, perhaps, uh, a Baptist. And, you know, she's not very well catechized in Catholicism. So, you know, she's led into a relationship with this Baptist. Uh, uh, Baptists are not taught that you can't remarry. I mean, that doesn't seem to be prevalent in Baptistic moral theology in our day and age. So this this... Baptist man who might be a praying man, might be a fervent disciple, decides to marry this woman who's been abandoned. And he sees it as a way to worship Christ and to serve Christ to help this woman and her children to be a father to her children. So they get married in a Baptist church, right? And and also through the civil channels of whatever city and state they live in or country. Well, years go on, and both of them read their way back into the Catholic Church, or both of them read themselves or uh, study and realize that, wow, um, the Catholic Church is the true church, and um, <clears throat> they need to come into the, into the Catholic Church. But as they both approach the church, um, the bishop has a discussion with them and says, well, wait a minute, we know who you are. You were a Catholic. We were able to get some records from your previous parish, and we see that you contracted a marriage in the Catholic Church to whatever name, okay? Whatever the man's name was. Well, we're going to have to look into that because if that marriage union is still valid uh, and active, meaning he's still alive, um, you have 
re you retain obligations to the indissoluble bond of matrimony to that man, even though he has abandoned you. And assuming this is the case, you could not possibly contract a new union. And so the whatever celebration you had in that Baptist church, um, you guys did it in, you know, in conscience. You did it in purity. You didn't know you weren't allowed to do that. But it, it remains an attempt at matrimony, but an unsuccessful one because you're already married to this other man from years ago. And so as a result, if you too want to enter the church and receive communion, you will have to uh, you will have to live as brother and sister and not have any more uxurio relations of adultery outside of marriage, right? <clears throat> and um, that is going to come as like the weight of a ton on that family. Perhaps they never knew that. Perhaps the woman never realized that she couldn't remarry. Whatever the case is, they're going to go home from that meeting with a heavy pulse, with a lot of anxiety, and they're going to be worried, you know, hey, Lord, what what is this new trial that you've brought into our lives, right? And <clears throat> um, push comes to shove. She says, well, I really want to live in, I, I really want to return to Catholicism because, honey, as we studied, this is the true church. And we want to go to heaven when we die, don't we? Yes, hon, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So I want to live in continence. I don't want you to leave me and I don't want to leave you. We'll stay together. We'll live in continence. And as John Paul II said, we could be fully integrated into the church all the way to the very Holy Supper, the chalice of salvation. What do you say? And he turns around and says, well, you know, I've thought about this and I'm starting to rethink whether Catholicism is true. And I'm even going to go ahead and say that if you are going to be firm in this decision of continence, and I, I respect your decision, if that is what you want to do, but I, I can tell you this, I never asked for that path in my life. I'm still young. I don't have any children of my own. I've been taking care of your children. And if I, I, I at me, I, I feel like I, could, I should go back to the Baptist church where I feel more comfortable. This is a very scary thing to me. Um, so if you do choose continence, I'm leaving. And you no longer have access to my bank account. Um, and it would be best for us to just um, go our separate ways and never look to each other ever again. Well, she hears that and she says, wow, in her mind, she's like, wow, if, if he leaves me, I don't have any, I, I don't have a job. Perhaps they moved to the States. She doesn't speak English very well. Um, it's a whole new tornado, baby. I mean, this is going to be rough, right? Well, Amoris Letizia looks at this situation and says, if she and he say, you know what, we we just can't stop. I'm we're not gonna, you know, she says, look, she goes back to the bishop and says, look, my husband, well, not my husband, but my you know, quote unquote husband, um, is not really down with the path of continence and Whereas I would be down with it, uh, he isn't. If he and if 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 I choose to never be with him intimately again, he's going to leave. And I'm not. And I'm afraid that if I do that, it's going to bring greater sin, greater guilt on my conscience for bringing pain and disaster into my own emotional health, my the emotional health of my children, um, and just various other disasters. Right. And so, Bishop, um, I, I plan on cooperating with him in continuing in sexual intercourse. Is there anything that can be done? Well, the bishop um, turns to him and says, well, he goes to the file cabinet, pulls out a Morris Letizia, and says, well, hun, um, young girl, young daughter, young sister, uh, 
there is a path of discernment here. Um, you're continuing in these adulterous intercourses that you're going to be with um, Mr. So-and-so, who is not your husband. It is technically adultery. It is technically a contravention of God's will. Uh, the church could never condone you to do it. The church could never tell you that it's right. Um, Pope Francis could never tell you that this is what you should do. But um, your quote-unquote fornication plan is not the same thing as like the uh, college senior Ralph Waterhouse uh you know, quarterback MVP who's got a fornication plan in his frat house with a different woman every every weekend, right? That would be obviously a sin of high-handedness, obviously destroying any kind of life of God in, in his heart. So, so while we have fornication in, like, the situation of a football player in college, just living it up with all the girls, hanging out with the homies. He has a fornication plan that would be clearly unacceptable at the holy altar. But your fornication plan has a... It's different. Everybody looking at it would it see it's obviously different. You, you prefer to do the right thing, but you find yourself trapped with all these different difficulties in, involved and so your your liberty, your culpability is reduced. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so let's get back to the sixth guideline. That's what is going on here. If it is acknowledged that in a concrete case, there are limitations that mitigate responsibility and culpability, especially when a person believes he or she would incur a subsequent fault by harming the children of the new union. I just gave you an example of that. Amoris Letitia offers the possibility of having access to the sacraments of reconciliation in the Eucharist. All right. Now, does this mean that the sacrament of reconciliation implies that the sixth guideline is simply equal to the fifth guideline? So that even if these this if if a couple who is civilly remarried decide to go with option six, that they're bound to perfect continence, and if they fail at it, they can't go to communion. They've got to go to reconciliation, wherein they firmly quit and say, "No, we you know we or I am totally done with um, you know the." sin of adulterous moro more uxurio and i'm on the pathway of holiness i've repented i've made straight the highway you know i've made um you know i've i've cleansed my heart i'm ready to step forward and follow jesus in purity and i'm committing to never be involved intimately with a man who's not my husband no that cannot be the case because that's guideline number five so guideline number six means that this couple that I just gave you, let's just say Joe and Ann, Joe and Ann, or one of them at least, comes to the confession and says, look, I've, I've got other sins that I've committed, but as you know, Father, you know, we've got this plan. Um, I'm inhibited in my liberty and I'm mitigated in culpability. Um, I don't want to live in sin. I don't want to offend God, but I, I, I do have a plan to cooperate again with my, um, what I call my husband, but the church sees as my civil partner. I do have an intention. Um, I'm not going to blockade what he wants. He wants it. I'm going to give it to him because I, I think it's going to be worse if I don't. All right, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I absolve you of, of all your sins. And then you, she's, she's allowed to go to communion. That is what is being um, 
uh, presented here. It would make no sense to say that um, that what she would need to do is simply repent, like like the people in uh, guideline number five are, because guideline number six is saying that this whole continence absolution cycle is not feasible. Do you see? All right. So that's really where uh, we don't even need to go any further. I've just explained to you what the eighth chapter of Amoris Laetitia envisions as possible in the pathway to the sacraments for the for uh, rem remarried divorcees. All right. Do we have any other help to aid in this interpretation that I'm giving? There are, but before I go into that, let me just explain a little bit why this can be a, a, pent a potential problem. <laughs> Excuse me, let me just get a sip of water here before I continue. All right. So <clears throat> what I've just described to you is not uh, what some people might say is Pope Francis just saying, hey, if you're remarried, you're div you know, divorced, remarried, your first spouse is still alive, don't worry about it. We'll configure you in and, 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 and we'll get you into the altar one way or the other. Don't worry about it. Open door policy. No, no. Even if that was Pope Francis's intention, which I don't think it is, even if that was his intention, that's not what he said. And that's not what he wrote. That's not what the Buenos Aires bishops say. However, <clears throat> we might be able to envision in our imagination the possibility of great reductions to responsibility and culpability but if you watch that stream i just did a few days ago maybe four days ago uh diagnosing the problem in the catholic church i go over what the bible teaches about repentance and the call of conversion and what jesus christ said is required of us if we want to be his disciples and <clears throat> One of the problems in our day and age is that we see that as we've been watering it down, basically. We've been watering it down. We've been going off with cliches like, you know, the, being a disciple is not, a, you know, a way to for the self-righteous, you know, to put their thumbs under their overall straps and, you know, boast in how righteous they are and, you know, get into a rocking chair with their thumbs under those under those overall straps and rock back and forth and look down upon the sinners with down you know down their nose at all those wicked sinners and we're we're just righteous um and and you see some theologians and in hierarchs that you know they they say no that's not the way we got to be you know we're this is the way of mercy you know everybody all are welcome all are welcome, right? And so what it does is it waters down what Christ demands as a bare minimum to be his disciple. As as you guys know, if you watch that, um, <clears throat> if you watch that stream of mine, uh, I go through what our Lord taught. And he taught that to be his disciple, you have to renounce everything. It's like going through a toll, or it's like going through a scan. Like if you know you're at the airport nowadays, they you know you put luggage and all kinds of things through a scanner. Jesus said, "If you want to be my disciple, you have to count the cost. If you don't renounce everything, you cannot be my disciple." Which is it means you're going to go through a scan, and if your heart is ninety nine percent in love with Christ. He's going to say, eh, turn around. You're not worthy to be my disciple. What, Eric? Is that true? Is that, I mean, what about faith of a mustard seed? And what about the apostles? They were sinners. And for goodness sake, Peter denied our Lord three times. And 
Yes, I understand that. It's not the way of perfection. But you have to be willing to, to drop everything. And when you fail, you are willing to drop everything over and over and over again. And that's what Peter did. He was willing to die on the day of Pentecost. Um, <clears throat> so this Amoris Letitia, Buenos Aires guideline number six plan, my concern is that, yes, my heart goes out to this woman that we called Anne. Um, but look at the precedent that it sets. There are two concerns. Number one, how do we conceive the reality of somebody who says they want to stop fornicating, but they know they're going to continue with it again? and still achieve a firm purpose of amendment. That's really the, that's that's the, the core, that's the pulp of the issue. How successful can a pastor be? How successful can a human being be to try and x-ray their soul almost like rolling the dice to see if a certain number comes face up, whether, they, whether they're on the venial side or the mortal side, if they say that they know they're going to cooperate with more uxorio again if it comes up in the merit, in the union, in the civil union. That's very difficult to, difficult to conceive in reality. We can try to imagine it, but it's really tough to see in reality. Those are that, that's not concern number one. Concern number two: the precedent that it sets has a lot of potential. What if you have two females who get civilly married? adopt children or whatever, do surrogacy or wh whatever route they take um, to, you know, have children. And they raise these children. Um, and then they want to come to the church and, you know, but they also don't want to separate. And they also find sim a similar story as to why they need to engage in um, you know, you understand what I'm saying. In in very very grave uh, acts of objectively unacceptable behavior in the bedroom. <clears throat> if if we're all if we've already opened the door enough for the woman and like I just described, um, could it be that we're going to be looking that far? You know. So it sets a precedent on a particular matter, the, 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 the moral law on sexual conduct. It presents, uh, it gets into such a grave territory that uh, fooling in these ways with the conscience and elastic, elasticity of the human psyche on whether the person is in venial or <clears throat> it's uh <clears throat> excuse me I'm getting over a cold and a cough it's frightening to me how these things are getting configured and how they're not going to set a precedent for further doors and i think we've even seen one recently with the uh opening of the doors to bless uh same-sex couples I'm not going to mention that any, any further in this stream. That'll be for another one. <clears throat> but Amoris was definitely used for that one as well. And I'll explain in a future podcast, Lord willing. Um, so those are my concerns. Is it, her is it heretical? I'm not going to say it's heretical. Um, what I can tell you is that I am unable to harmonize 
what Amoris Laetitia opens up with the Christian tradition, with the basic gospel, right? And, you know, people online have uh, taken a hostile reaction, have, 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 have reacted in a hostile way to people such as myself who, who say that, because it sounds like what I'm doing is uh, engendering doubt or, or I'm propagating doubt in the uh, magisterium of the Pope. Well, <clears throat> to those apostolates, ministries, and uh, YouTube outlets that have that point of view, uh, I just want to point you to a scholar who nobody considers to be a rad trad, who's, who's you know, <clears throat> high on weed. You know, we're talking about Dr. Matthew Levering, who is a well-respected Catholic scholar and theologian. He does work with Word on Fire, Bishop Robert Barron. Uh, he's consulted by a variety of avenues in the mainstream Catholic Church. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you read his book on the indissolubility of marriage, Amoris Laetitia in context, uh, you'll see that he, he doesn't take a different reading of the matter than I do. In fact, in his uh, book, Engaging the Doctrine of Marriage, <clears throat> which is a book he wrote after this one, he says the following about Amoris Laetitia, which I think is worth reading for my listeners here. <clears throat> this is footnote 32 in the introduction. So if you open up the book to the introduction, go to the um, the pages that give you the footnotes. It's, it's going to be footnote 32. He says the following. <clears throat> I think, so quote, I think there are formulations and theological arguments in Amoris Laetitia that are not adequate to the doctrine of the indissolubility of marriage. Furthermore, the new pastoral strategy regarding Eucharistic communion runs counter to the reality of, meritable, of marital indissolubility as I show in the book, close quote. So what you have there <clears throat> is uh, Dr. Levering <clears throat> expressing concerns that are equal with mine, <clears throat> that the new pastoral strategy, which is guideline number six, which is chapter eight of Amoris, um, that envisions the possibility of people who choose to continue in violation of God's law. Namely, more usurio, violating the, the indissoluble bond of marriage between either both or one of them with their real spouse that they're not with. <clears throat> and yet still being somehow counted worthy of both absolution and holy communion. It raises more questions than it does answers. And quite frankly, I just don't know how to reconcile. All right. I'm not alone. In fact, Levering says, <clears throat> Levering just points to the major interpreters of Amoris that Pope Francis himself puts validation on. Cardinal Francesco Coco Palmario, he wrote about Amoris Laetitia, gives the interpretation I'm giving you right now. Cardinal Walter Casper, same thing. Cardinal Fernandez, as we're going to see here shortly, he does the same. Cardinal uh, Christoph Schomborn, same thing. In fact, Pope Francis said that if you want to understand the orthodoxy of Amoris, go to Cardinal Schomborn. All right. All right. So let's move on. What what do we have that would verify this? What what do we have that would verify the interpretation I gave? Um, well. It's the article I mentioned that was written by um, Cardinal Fernandez when he was Archbishop Victor Manuel Fernandez. 
<clears throat> it's called Chapter 8 of Omoris Letitia, What is Left After the Storm. So I'm going to share my screen, and, and we're going to go through some statements in that uh, in, in that document. And um, But first, what I'm going to do is go to the response to the dubia of Cardinal Duca, because a lot of people today who are following in this train where Amoris Letizia just, it's just the continence route that John Paul II gave. They, they think that Fernandez said that in his response to um, the, <clears throat> to, uh, to uh, Cardinal Duca. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at that and uh, see why that fails to to be a, a cogent uh, position to have. So let me uh, stop screen. Okay, stop sharing. Present, share. All right. Uh, hopefully you can see it. Um, I'm going to try to zoom in here. Um, so you know that this is the Dicastrium Pro Doctrina Fide for the audience of the Holy Father. Responds to a series of questions posed by His Eminence, Dominic Cardinal Duca. All right. So we're going to go to <clears throat> the thir number three, which gets to this issue uh, right away. So it says, um, or Cardinal Duca asks, is it a decision of the ordinary magisterium of the church? based on the document Amoris Letitia. Fernandez responds, as the Holy Father recalls in his letter to the delegate of the pastoral region of Buenos Aires, that's the one we read, Amoris Letitia was the result of the work and prayer of the whole church with the mediation of two synods and the Pope. This document is based on the magisterium of previous pontiffs who already recognized the possibility for divorced people in new unions to access the Eucharist, as long as they take on themselves the duty to live in complete continence. That is, by abstinence from acts proper to married couples, as John Paul II proposed. That's important to see there. As John Paul II proposed or to commit themselves to living their relationship as friends, again, in, in continence, as proposed by Benedict XVI. Pope Francis maintains the proposal of full continence for the divorce and remarried in a new union. But, <laughs> this is where it goes, but admits that there may be difficulties in practice, all right? Therefore, he allows in some cases, after adequate discernment, the administration of the sacrament of reconciliation, even when one fails to be faithful to the continence proposed by the church. Now, I had already showed you before that Guideline number five is the one that gives you the JP, the JP2 Benedict XVI route of continence confession when fail when failure happens. <clears throat> so guideline number six can't be the same option when failure happens. So the failing that Victor Manuel Fernandez is talking about here is not the failing of guideline number five, where hey. Um, you know, John or Joe and Anne, civilly married. They're not, they're not truly married, but they live together. They're in perfect continence. They fail. Then they go to confession. They are absolved. Then they can receive Holy Communion. That's not the kind of failing that Fernandez has in mind here. We know that because, for the reason I just gave, and also because of what he says in the next um, response to a dubium, all right? <clears throat> Number four, Duca says, is it the intention of a Morris Letizia to institutionalize this solution through a permission 
or an official decision given to each couple. Fernandez responds, point one of the document, Criterios Basiscos para la Aplicación del Capitulo 8 de Amoris Laetitia explicitly states, the, it, it explicitly states, I'm not going to read that to you, but w- the next sentence is really what we need to get to. It is therefore a matter of pastoral accompaniment as an exercise of the way of charity, which is nothing other than an invitation to follow the way of Jesus, of mercy and reinstatement, Amoris Laetitia opens the possibility of accessing the sacraments of reconciliation reconciliation and Eucharist when, this is where you need to pay attention, when in a particular case, there are limitations that attenuate responsibility and culpability. Okay? Well, I'll stop there. Now, if the kind of failure at continence that Fernandez is talking about in the previous response, if the failure there is simply, hey, we're committed to perfect continence, we fail, we got to go to confession. If that's the case, then um, looking at the attenuations of responsibility and culpability um, are not even in view. Because if they're failing and then going to confession and resolving never to participate in more uxurio again, uh attenuations to responsibility and culpability are no longer relevant because they're absolved you don't need to analyze responsibility and culpability in those cases because a firm purpose of amendment is clearly given they're absolved they're ready to go come to the altar receive our lord in the, in the sacrament so when Fernandez says here that this possibility is open in only a particular case, not a general one where, hey, did they, all those people who are remarried and living in new unions and they're, they're living under the same roof, all of them, if they repent, go to confession, that's it. They can go to, they can go to communion. That's a general case. <clears throat> Fernandez here is talking about a particular case where there are limitations that attenuate responsibility and culpability. That's only a factor to analyze when the person who's showing up for confession and Eucharist are still unprepared to fully quit the more uxoria. All right? And we know this because the same man who's responding here um quoted his own article that he wrote for the Medellin. Like I said, that's the, the Latin American journal for, 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 for Latin American bishops. And we're going to go to that. <clears throat> but um, keep in mind um, this line here. Pope Francis, Pope Francis, maintains the proposal of full continence for the divorce and remarried in a new union, but admits there may be difficulties in practice, okay? Remember that, all right? Because we'll see, he's quoting his own article. <laughs> he's quoting his own article, um, and he's, he's also alluding to Amoris Laetitia, but we're going to see um, how he's quoting his own article as well. So let me now share um, the screen and bring up that article. All right. Hopefully you can see it on the screen now. All right. So this is Chapter 8 of Amoris, What is Left After the Storm. And so we're not going to read all of it. We're going to go to the uh, uh, primary uh, places where this, this issue gets answered for us. All right. See what he says here. Francis, see, it's under this heading, perfect continence, okay? Francis 
recognizes the possibility of proposing perfect continence to the divorced in a new union, but admits that there may be difficulties in practicing. All right. That's he's basically quoting himself, and he's also referring to um cross-referencing footnote 329 of Amoris. Then he says, footnote 364 gives a place to administering the sacrament of reconciliation to them even when listen to this, even when a when new falls are foreseeable. Now, what does that mean? That's also something that get has some variety of interpretation. Um, some people say, oh, well, you know, what does this mean? Does it does this mean like, uh, am I ever going to sin again after I go to confession? Well, of course I can foresee that I'm going to sin again. That's not what Fernandez has in mind here by foreseeable. Uh, what he means is that there is a plan to continue with it. And we'll, we're going to see why that is and why he says that. <clears throat> All right. He goes on. There, Francis calls into question priests who demand of penitence a purpose of amendment so lacking in nuance that it causes mercy to be obscured by the pursuit of a supposedly pure justice. Let's pause there. So Fernandez is hearkening back to Francis in Amoris Laetitia, um, either paragraph 312 or footnote 312, I don't know which. But Francis in Amoris Laetitia, he criticizes uh, priests who demand what we would all consider a plain and simple purpose of amendment. Hey, you were in fornication? Yes, Father, I've committed fornication five times. All right. Well, you must repent and quit that and never do that again. Is that what's in your heart right now? To forsake, to abandon, and to live in holiness? Yes. Okay. That's a plain and simple firm purpose of amendment uh, for, for plain thinking Catholics and Christians abroad, right? Fernandez hearkens to Pope Francis, who criticizes priests who do that kind of thing. What Francis wants is a the ability to look at a person's purpose of amendment that is not so straightforward. Okay, well, let's continue. We'll find some more information about that. And there he takes up an important statement of St. John Paul II, who held that even the anticipation of a new fall should not prejudice the authenticity of the resolution. So here he's quoting John Paul II, who did, in all fairness, he did say this. He did. He did say that we should not say that a firm purpose of amendment, in other words, true repentance, we should, we should not always say true repentance is lacking uh, even when they're even when the penitent anticipates a repetition of the sin he's committing all right now that's not too difficult to conceive of um i think that that is fair in some cases okay um but we're, we're gonna see as we get further into this document that um Fernandez has a more intense understanding of this word anticipation so much that it turns into what's called a plan, a, a plan to continue in the sin. <clears throat> so he's, Fernandez is just trying to grab as much ammunition from the past here, from John Paul II. But we're going to see how he makes subtle distinctions and intensifications. He goes on, against this cautious precision of St. John Paul II, some seem to demand a kind of strict control of what others do in intimacy. <clears throat> strict control 
what could that be a reference to? Well, that's a reference to a, a priest who would say, hey, you guys are not supposed to be intimate. Therefore, do nothing together, right? And if you don't plan to quit and do nothing together, you can't be absolved. That's what Francis is, uh, that's what Fernandez is getting at here. Um, he goes on, we must congratulate those we must congratulate, heartily grad, congratulate those who manage to live in perfect continence, enriching their daily cohabitation in various ways. That is, the, the, the daily cohabitation as brother and sister in various ways. But that does not imply ignoring that others have serious difficulties in achieving this. Do you see what we're getting at here? Let, let's hit the pause button. Fernandez is talking about Two people who don't believe they're not married, they cannot have sexual intercourse, they're living under the same roof, and they have very great difficulty with the path of continence. That is a uh, uh, guideline number five in the Buenos Aires uh, Bishops. And so he's he's scooching closer and closer to build a case for why perhaps one of these Catholics who's involved in this. Uh, ongoing more uxorio situation may not have to give up the very same thing that somebody does in 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 the sacrament of confession when they completely manifest an abrogation to their sin <clears throat> he's trying to scooch closer and closer as how to dial down the intensity of what's required inside the penitence of the penitent. You see? That's why he's going in this direction. All right. Um, he also says in another... <clears throat> um, uh, another section in this, he says, uh, but... His emphasis. Okay, here we go. Um, up here, we can start here. In any event, the specific and principal proposal of Francis, in line with the Synod, is not concerning the considerations on the formulation of the norm. Why then is this question part of the proposal? Because he calls for much attention to the language that is used to describe weak persons. For him, offensive expressions such as adulterer or fornicator should not necessarily be deduced from the general norms when referring to concrete persons. But his emphasis is rather on the question of the possible diminution of responsibility and culpability. Forms of conditioning can attenuate or nullify responsibility and culpability against any norm, even against negative precepts and absolute moral norms. This makes it possible. <clears throat> Listen to this line, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to this line. This makes it possible not always to lose the life of sanctifying grace in a more uxorio cohabitation. Let's hit, hit the pause button. I hope you can deduce what's going what, what's being said here. <clears throat> He's saying it, it's it's not always possible to lose the state of grace in an ongoing adulterous active sexual intercoursing uh, situation um, between two people who are not married. Now, is that possible? Well, yeah, you know, as you you remember, if you if you listen to the exchange that we had with Timothy Gordon and classical theist, classical theist was talking about how we can use our imagine our imagination. Um, to conceive of this possibility, right? I mean, it's not just purely imaginative. I, I even th can think of a, a reality here. What about two people um, who were married, quote-unquote, in the Catholic Church, 
because the local bishop um, handed a decree, a decree of nullity to one of the one of the two persons. And so they they were under the impression that they were free to marry, but the bishop made a false judgment on that. And and it happens to be the case that the decree of nullities is wrong and that the person actually is bound to another person in a prior marriage. But the dicastery made a mistake, a decree of nullity was given, and therefore a Catholic marriage was held between two people who actually never successfully contracted a nuptial union, do you see? Well, but they think they did. So does the church. The church hands them a document that says they're married. And so they go home, and for the next 10, 15 years, they live together in intercourse, thinking that it's lawful, but it's really ontologically more uxuria. But they do it in so much ignorance because the church gave them the green light so that they're actually able to hold sanctifying grace through this whole process because there's no internalization of a fault that becomes a grave matter um, reaching the level of mortal sin. Do you, un do you understand? All right. But, but we're not talking about that here, in the, right? Fernandez is not talking about those kind of situations. He's talking about people who know the norm. They know that they're not married. They know that they're not married. And, and yet they still have a plan to do this. <clears throat> well, let's continue. Look at this heading. When one cannot. <clears throat> Francis considers that even knowing the norm, meaning knowing the norm that two people who are not married cannot be uh, sexually active, Francis considers that even knowing the norm, a person, quote, may be in a concrete situation which does not allow him or her to act differently and decide otherwise without further sin. As the Synod Fathers put it, factors may exist which limit the ability to make a decision. He speaks of subjects who are not in a position to understand, value, or fully practice the objective requirements of the law. In another paragraph, he affirm, reaffirms, under circumstances, people find it very difficult to act differently. Okay. He also, Pope Francis also recalls that John Paul II recognized that in certain cases for serious reasons, such as for the example the children, children's upbringing, a man and a woman cannot satisfy the obligation to separate. Let us note that St. John the Paul II recognized that they cannot. Pope Benedict XVI was even more forceful in saying that in some cases, objective circumstances are present which make the cohabitation irreversible, in fact. Now, what he, he's, he's quoting John Paul and Benedict the XVI, but John Paul, John Paul and Benedict are not talking about the uh, impossibility or the, the irreversibility of adulterous affairs, uh, adulterous intercourse. It, it's, they're talking about the unfeasibility of the civil, the persons in this civil union of leaving each other, you know, due to the children, right? Um, <clears throat> but John Paul and Benedict both maintain that they have to be sexually pure, perfectly pure. I mean, perfect continence in order for them to receive communion. So so Fernandez and Pope Francis here, they're they're like they're 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 trying to afford ammunition for another rule that they have coming um that is not what um John Paul or Benedict uh said. Okay. Now <clears throat> I want to go to another section here and it should be the last one. Um and this will kind of be the nail in the coffin for against those who are trying to say that Amoris Laetitia is just, it's just the way of continence and confession, for goodness sake, before communion. Continence, failure, confession, Eucharist. That's the, um, that is the, uh, the formula or the, 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 that's the hermeneutic or the interpretation that 
some people online are taking as a way to defend Amoris Letizia. I'm here to say that Pope Francis and Cardinal Fernandez are, uh, they disagree with you 100%. Okay. Um, so the next part of this document that I want to take my listeners to, to prove that, um, is right here. So if you look on the screen, <clears throat> Fernandez says, up to now, meaning the Catholic pastoral discipline, up to now, up to now, discernment about attenuated culpability did not allow for removing consequences at the external or disciplinary level. The disciplinary consequences of the norm remain unaltered because they were based only on an objective fault against an absolute norm. Francis proposes to go one step further. It is true that the general norm is not purely a discipline, but it is related to a theological truth, just as such as the union between Christ and the church, which is reflected in marriage. But sometimes undue conclusions from particular theological considerations are derived when they are translated into rigid discipline that admits no discernment whatsoever. This is the point where Francis makes a change with respect to previous practice. Listen to that last line, folks. This is the point where Francis makes a change with respect to previous practice. Now, here's where you need to put on your glasses and put your thinking caps on and maybe even take a snapshot of. Under this new heading, Fernandez says, the legitimacy of a change in discipline. Ladies and gentlemen, if Amoris Letizia, if guideline number six ratified by Pope Francis put into the Acta Apostolic Cesades, if it simply reiterates John Paul II's requirement for full continence, when you fail, go to confession, get cleansed and absolved, go to communion. If that's all Amoris Letizia is envisioning, there is no change in discipline. And yet we have here this previous line. This is the point where Francis makes a change with respect to previous practice up to now, right? So he's talking about John Paul II and Benedict XVI's plan is changing. Ah, let's read. Is this change possible and acceptable? Can Francis accept what was taught by St. John Paul II and yet open a door that was closed? Do you see that? I have to repeat that for some folks. Can Francis accept what was taught by John Paul II and yet open a door that was closed? Yes, because an evolution in the church's understanding of her own doctrine and its disciplinary consequences is possible. Let's look at some historical examples. I'm not going to read these to you. I could tell you what they are. He goes over the... the the doctrinal evolutions of the uh, church and state religious liberty from Mirari Voss of, of Pope Gregory the Sixteenth and um, Dignitatis Humanae. Fernandez thinks it's it's a dog it's a reversal it's a magisterial reversal. There were positions that were put forward by guys like Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, Pope Pius the Ninth, <clears throat> Pope Nicholas the Fifth. Right, but this contradicts dog, um, dignitatis humanae. Do you understand? Fernandez is pointing to a magisterial reversal in order to garner support for Francis opening a new door that John Paul never opened. I hope that's clear. Um, he he goes over some other ones about uh, slavery and. Um, human dignity um 
So, um, if it's true that Amoris Letizia is simply opening the way to John Paul II's resolution only, why would Fran Fernandez take pains to talk about um, the discernment process of looking at attenuations of responsibility and culpability? You don't need to do that with John Paul II's um, disciplinary door. They come to confession, make a firm purpose of resolution to not commit that sin ever again, and they're immediately put back into communion with the church. Um, and, and they can they can they can take a sip from the chalice of salvation. There's no need to analyze just you know culpability responsibility because they're revoking their right to commit that sin again. Do you understand? That's why Fernandez is going throughout this whole process trying to uh, expose these psychological complexities of a human sinner because we're dealing with somebody who plans to continue. Oh, that's right. I didn't I didn't show let me let me show that again because some people might be saying, "Eric, you said plan. I don't I didn't see that in there." All right. Um if you want to see where plan comes up, um here it is, okay? Um, Amoris Letizia here on the screen. Amoris Letizia refers to people aware, aware of the severity of their situation. So in other words, they understand that they're in fornication. That's what that means. All right. He goes on. Um, Amoris Letizia refers to people aware of the severity of their situation, but with great difficulty of going back without feeling in conscience that one would fall into new sins. Um, so in other words, they they realize they're in an you know a more uxurio, but it's it's really difficult to get out of it, right? Okay, then it says, um, then he goes on to say that culpability is diminished because the capacity for a decision is strongly conditioned. Does not mean presenting one's situation as a personal plan consistent with the gospel. This is why discernment is not closed, but is dynamic. It must remain ever open to new stages of growth and to new decisions which can enable the ideal to be more fully realized. Do you see the logical necessity implied here? He's saying you've got people who are aware of the severity of their situation. In other words, they can't continue in more uxorio, but if they go back, it's, it's hurting their conscience to, to stop it. And so culpability is diminished thereby, right? But then Fernandez says, even so, even if culpability is diminished, this does not mean you're presenting your personal plan, which is to continue in more usurio. It's not to present the personal plan as if it were consistent with the ideal of the gospel. Then, he's, then, he, then he explains how the discernment process has to be dynamic, and the persons who are involved in this more uxorio continuation have to be open to new stages of growth where the ideal can be more fully realized. Okay. Um, then he goes on to say this, according to an authentic understanding of the law of gradualness, invites us to respond better to God. All right, let's stop here. So it it's not John Paul II's route of continence, confession, and communion. Because if that was the case, there would be no need to talk about culpability, conscience being tinged, and then a dynamic of um, a per, you know, personal plan that's not consistent with the ideal of the gospel, and then you know, looking for ways to more fully realize the ideal. Um, that wouldn't be logically uh, possible. Um, the uh, there's another yeah. So it, it's it, I think he has another place where he says personal choice. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, let's see where else personal choice. Um, <clears throat> okay. Once again, he says, Fernandez says, once again, we may we may say that this does not imply 
watering down an objective value. What Francis suggests is the situation of a person who, in dialogue with the pastor, does not present the intimate acts of a more uxorio cohabitation as subjectively moral, that is to say, as the object of a personal choice that legitimates them. It only presents them as difficult to avoid in their concrete circumstances, even if they are sincerely willing to grow in this point. Circumstances can diminish culpability, but not transform an act, immoral by virtue of its object, into an act that one may justify as a choice, okay? Um, in fact, the same Amoris Laetitia rejects the attitude of someone who flaunts an objective sin as if it were part of the Christian ideal. Therefore, it is clear that Francis does not admit that the act is, a just, is justifiable as a personal choice. So here, um, Fernandez is saying that you can't say that the choice to continue in more uxurio and be worthy of absolution of communion at the same time is is like a new choice that you could justify you can't the pope is still saying that's wrong it's still wrong but it's still a choice that can be made that admits that it's wrong but it's difficult to stop and they're willing to grow and so it implies the continuation you see um so i i i hope that you know this is coming across um you know, uh, clear enough to convey what is being uh, understood, right? All right, so we're at an hour and a half. I think that's enough. You know, um, we've had we've been at this now since 2016. Um, so what's that? Seven years. Um, I remember waking up in the morning, like at 4 a.m., the day that Amoris Laetitia was published in 2016. I printed it out, read it, and I can't, the the interpretation I'm giving to you right now is the same interpretation I got the first time I read it. Um, so I, I I've I've been there since the beginning, and I've had lots of conversations with people from different vantage points on the matter, <clears throat> and I think that um, I think we have too much confirmation, too much confirmation. That this is the interpretation. So, you know, what do I say about this? Does, does this mean that the, the gates of hell have prevailed against the church? I, I don't think so. Um, but it's certainly something to be concerned about. And I think we need to make use of Canon 212 and perhaps even start looking at the moral law and... Um, reason, divine revelation, baptismal canonical rites to, to try and um, put put some steroids in Canon 212 um, to, to raise concerns over this issue. Um, I don't think that uh, people out there who are trying to defend Amoris Laetitia from the interpretation I gave you here uh, I, I don't think they're they're doing a good job at at the reading. The reading skills are not up to par. Um, and I don't I don't think it's like a matter of intelligence or low IQ. Um, I think that some some really smart people have a blockade in their minds. Um, perhaps it, it's a, it's a uh, um, a limit to the faculty of the will. They don't want to see that this is the interpretation of a Morris Laetitia, so they work in you know, Rubik's cubes to figure out some other alternative way. But, you know, you we've got Pope Francis, who was clear enough. You know, I'm not one of those guys that says he's always ambiguous. Sometimes he's just clear. I think Amoris is clear. Uh, Cardinal Fernandez, who's known as the ghost writer of Chapter 8, he, come out, he came out and wrote a whole article on this matter. I printed it out. I got it marked up all over the place. Um. You, you, yeah, just, I mean, if you want to, you know, I forgot to say, if you want to read that article, just type in chapter eight of Amoris Laetitia, what is left after the storm, Victor Manuel Fernandez. You can find an English translation from Google. 
Too many confirmations. Theologians like Matthew Levering and all of the scholarship that is put into his footnotes, all the people he quotes, theologians, cardinals, people who are in the hierarchy who confirm what's been said here. Okay. Um, what else is there to say? Um, oh, yeah. If, if you know anybody who is um, got a mighty fine influence in the Fellowship of Catholic Online Media, who'd like to talk about this with me because they see that I've misread something, uh, please send them my way. I'd love to have them on the channel to have a discussion um, to talk about this further. Uh, but I, th I think I think I'm going to wrap it up here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for those who were listening. <clears throat> if you notice, I have a new background here, a new brick background. That's my wife's idea. She wants me to look like a hot shot. <laughs> so we got a new background in the wall. She's a professional photographer, so she knows how to do that. And we've been trying to get this really fancy Canon camera um, to be the to to be my video component, but we still we're, we're struggling with technical difficulties on it. So um, there is a there might be a change to come where I I look better on screen. So we'll see if that's uh if that's ever going to happen so anyway god bless you guys have a good evening and uh we'll see you next time on next stream lord willing oh,